Hello, hello. We are live with Nicole Vonderhoeven today. And today we're going to talk about the YouTube lessons that Nicole learned from growing her channel from 31 to over 20,000 subscribers in the last year, her YouTube monetization, how that's been going for her, and how she uses Obsidian to be more productive as a creator. Uh, welcome everybody to The Inner Creator, a podcast focused on the art and business of being a creator, how to build the most impactful videos, audiences, and businesses possible. I'm your host, Peter Sue. I'm a former investment banker at Goldman Sachs turned singer songwriter turned content creator here in San Francisco. And today we'll be interviewing my friend, Nicole Vonderhoeven. We met a year ago in Ali Abdal's part-time YouTuber Academy, and we've been part of the same accountability group. Um, so I've had the, the fortune and inspiration to be able to just chat with you almost every week about our YouTube channels, um, to give you all out there quick background on Nicole. She's basically one of the most curious, passionate, and productive people I've I've ever met, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating that, and I've seen that week after week. She is a YouTuber that loves tech, travel, and taking notes, especially with Obsidian. She's become really well-known for that, and she's basically built a community of... I, I guess you call them Obsidianites. Um, very, they're very active community on her Patreon. Uh, she just launched her course yesterday, Obsidian for Everyone. We're gonna, we're gonna definitely talk about that too. And uh, she did that all while traveling to eight countries last year, reading fifty books, and moving to a whole new country and learning another language, and while working full time as a developer advocate at Grafana K6. So. Um, yeah, that let's just dive into it and start at the beginning. Uh, so Nicole, can you tell us just how were you like where where are you originally from and where'd you where'd you grow up? And then um what were you like as a kid? Like what what, what were you interested in? Sure. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, Peter, that was so awesome. That was <laughs> like such a good introduction. I feel like, oh, no, I hope um, I hope I live up to all the nice things you said. Um, I was born in the Philippines. It's hard to say where I'm from now because I I didn't grow up there and I never felt like I belonged there. Um, what was I like as a kid? Jeez, um, I was a nerd. I was a bookworm. I still am, honestly. Some things don't change. <laughs> I was the kind of kid that like didn't get an allowance in pocket money. I got my allowance in books because that's where all my allowance went anyway. My allowance was three books a week. <laughs> wow, your allowance was three books a week. Well, okay, okay. So then I gotta ask how how were your um your note taking skills back then? Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I've always <laughs> loved taking notes. Except back then I was taking like physical notes. And I did for most of my life, you know, like like most of us, I still have some some actual physical notebooks and hardback journals. And recently I've just switched to all digital, unfortunately. I also have like an extensive fountain pen collection. So yeah, I've always loved writing and taking notes. Hmm. Well, okay, we have a, a audience question from Ash Kundo, um, and shout out to everyone in the audience, Eunice, Rondell, Lila, Ash, what's up, everybody? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So Ash Kundo asked, um, he's very inclined about follicle growth, and he, he was curious, um, how do you get such lush hair? Um, <laughs> I don't do anything. <laughs> Um, thank you, I guess. I, I just jeans, maybe. I don't do anything special to it except not treat it very well because I bleach it to dye my hair. So there's that. All right. There, there you go, Ash. Well, so can you tell us just how you... I, I've been able to uh, follow along on your journey um, every week in our accountability group. But for everyone that's listening out there, and I think it's a lot of people that are rising creators um, that just want to improve their their craft, like the art of being a YouTuber, uh, the business of it as well. Um, so can you just tell us why you started your YouTube channel? Sure. Um, this YouTube channel or just YouTube in general? Like, let's go all the way back. Like, what was the, the first catalyst um, for like, like your Lucky Dippers, the travel channel or, or even anything before? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was Lucky Dippers. It started because um, my husband and I decided that we were going to change our lives. We, we saved, we had saved up enough and were financially independent at that point. We decided to go and because I was learning Dutch at the time, I don't know why, because I didn't know anyone who spoke Dutch. I, we were in Australia and I, I convinced them to come to the Netherlands with me for a five week vacation. And during that vacation, I got a job offer, an interview and an offer. And so we went back to Australia, packed up our lives. And in two months we were moving back to the Netherlands and I realized that um, a lot of people were interested in that because it was such a whirlwind change and we'd completely changed our lives and it wasn't the first time that I'd done it. And people started asking like, oh, are you going to be traveling? Are you, you know, how, what's that, what's it going to be like in Europe? And so I guess I just wanted to share that with people. And so my original YouTube video, um, I, it was, it was in Lucky Dipper. So it was more travel related with, with me and my husband. Got it. So it sounds like it was, it was, uh, a lot of things happened in your life. You got, you love the Netherlands by, as a visitor, you got a job offer, you moved, people wanted to, your friends wanted to learn about all your travels. Um, so for you was, was it? Is it fair to say like YouTube was more um, like was the was the benefit you got from it just just from having fun making the vlogs and sharing it with your friends and you you didn't really like how did you think about like that whole you know how like Ollie talks about the whole um, fun like the hobby versus business spectrum like where would you say you were on that at that point? Yeah, hundred percent fun. <laughs> I don't really start things unless they're fun. And I very often don't continue them unless they're fun either. So yeah, I'm I'm still skewed that way even now. But yeah, back then definitely hundred percent fun. And maybe that was a little bit to my detriment too, just because just just because something is fun for you doesn't mean that it's valuable for anybody else, which is totally fine, you know. But like if your objective is to help people, then it can't be all about fun. Got it. So if, if, um, cause I, I, yeah. So if you're, if it's a vlog that you really enjoy making, like, like, uh, like if I vlogged about <laughs> the money tree behind my desk and I made a whole 10 minute video about it and I liked it, but it doesn't really help the audience that much then. So it's, oh, so it's, so I guess for yeah. you, like, when did you kind of become aware that you might want to think about the audience? Cause I think, you know, this is something I struggle with a lot. A lot of, I know a lot of our creator friends struggle with is, is, a lot of us are really passionate about things, but then sometimes we, but we also want to help people and make an impact with our videos. But we kind of like, I know for me, I'll, I'll so, like, I'll, I'll make a video um, and spend like 30 hours on it. And I, I really enjoy the whole process, but then it, it might not get the, it might not connect or help people the way I want to. Like, how did you become aware of that? You wanted to, you know, do it, do it for yourself, but also for the audience too. I think I, I've always been extroverted. So I always wanted to do it, not so much for other people, but with other people. And I feel very passionately about traveling in general and opening, opening your mind because travel really does open your mind and it exposes you to cultures that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have ever seen otherwise. And so my idea was to like encourage people to, to think outside the box, to learn new languages and not just to travel, but like to be a local somewhere else and really understand what that means to, to be that. And unfortunately, the way that I went around ab about doing it was just showing how trying to show how I was doing it. And travel vlogging is like a completely different thing. You're most often on camera when you're tired, hungry, lost, or a combination of all three. So you're not really in the best frame of mind to be creative. You're, you're not putting your best foot forward. And I found out that even though I was generally having fun, it was difficult to every step of the way think like, oh, let me get out my camera and, and record this. And it was kind of getting in the way of my enjoyment too. Uh, so, so this actually um, ties into a question from Azul. He asked, "How, how do you shoot 
when you're traveling? Like, cause he's nomading around the world and he's shooting. Like, how did you, you kind of mentioned it's tough, but like, how did you balance that where you, when you got to carry around cameras, chargers, hard drives, <laughs> all that stuff? Yeah. You learn very quickly to get by on the least amount of cameras possible. Um, I know in my in my travel channel, I did do a gear thing once and I had so many cameras, like seriously, so many cameras. I don't know what I did with, with that many cameras. I guess I just thought that to be good on YouTube that you just had to have all the best gear, but it was actually getting in the way. Cause I'd, I'd go to, to shoot something and be like, okay, now should I do the drone shot or should I do like this fancy, you know, like it just got in the way. And then before you know it, the moment has passed, you know, and I spent it wondering how I was going to best show it. It was, it was exhausting. So it was actually, I think I got better when I just had the one camera and I was like, I'm going to get really good at using this camera and editing this camera and all of the settings on it. I think that's when it started to get better. Also when you're, I don't know, I don't know how, how Azul travels, but I travel on just a backpack. Like I'll be away for up to three months and I'll just have a backpack. So I can't take all that stuff with me. So I think that's one thing, like really just travel light and then think about just documenting, not creating. Gary Vaynerchuk says this all the time. And I, I really resonate with it because if you think of something as like this big creative endeavor that you have to nail perfectly the first time, you may never do it. Honestly, if you just think about documenting things as they happen, then it's a little less daunting. I, I really love that. That personally resonates because, uh, as you know, I went, I did the Camino de Santiago, um, in the, in the summer and I was taking all these travel courses like Nathaniel Drew's, Johnny Harris's. And, um, I, I think in my head, I was trying to make it like a, do a little mini documentary. And so I was thinking about the story arcs, but then it affected me being present while I was trying to actually travel and be in the moment, like what you're talking about. And I still haven't posted, like I haven't taken the time to edit it because I think I, I got stuck in like making it a perfect like documentary or something versus like what you're talking about, actually just documenting. So that's, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And so I got asked like, what, so what was the camera that you, you like the one camera that you just <laughs> put in your bag and you mastered? Yeah, I that actually was um, a Canon one, but my camera now that I that I really love is my A sixty six hundred Sony A sixty six hundred. It's not the best, but it is mirrorless and things like their convenience, quality of life things like you can charge it using a USB a USB cable. You can't do that with Canon, so you have to bring around the charger. Like you just have to pare everything down, and the Sony just really fit in. Right. Always, uh, always nice to know what, what's in your gear bag. Um, so I know with like lucky dippers, you made it, you were pumping out videos. Like you made like a hundred videos, I think over like five years, um, from all your travels for like all over Europe, um, all around the world. Um, I guess at, at any points, were there any lulls where you're like, uh, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. It's, it's not fun for me. It's not connecting with the audience in the way I like, or was it always like, like on that tra like trajectory and yeah, from day one, <laughs> that doesn't go away. I feel that now it's like constant doubt. <laughs> Anytime you put anything, I mean, it's different for everyone. For me, anytime I make anything public, I second guess it, triple guess it. You know, I, I always question whether or not I should be doing this and who am I to be sharing my life and why Why would I think people would care? Those are the sort of things that, that are in the back of my mind all the time. <laughs> well, I, it's crazy because when we, when we catch up, uh, on our accountability zooms, I, I really never really perceive too much of that. Like, uh, it usually is like, yep. Um, I made my video, uh, for the week and I'm working on two videos for the next two and three weeks and, uh, got this lined up and that, so it, it seems like you don't have to deal with it too much. But like, how, how do you overcome that doubt? Like, why should, why would anybody listen to me? Like, does anyone care? Like, it's so much work. How do you, how do you power through that? 
I think the switch for me happened when I stopped trying to get over it. And I was just like, okay, clearly I'm just always going to have this voice in the back of my mind. How can I ignore it temporarily or maybe suppress it or like do stuff anyway? And I think there was just so much energy into thinking like, oh, I must not be that good because I still have this voice in my mind. What can I do to get better? And it was just, it was just exhausting. And now I'm just like, yeah, I know, I know you're still there, but you know, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Interesting. So acceptance that, yeah, that reminds me of the whole Elizabeth Gilbert, like you put, I think fear in your, uh, in the passenger seat. And it's like a little kid that's throwing a tantrum and you just like acknowledge it. It's like, Hey, I see you. Like, I know you're trying to help out and I appreciate yeah. it, but yeah. we're going to just keep going. <laughs> like, well, yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. like you, when you think about it that way, as if it's another person, I would never take that from anybody, but for some reason, cause it's me, I do take it, which is completely irrational. And then even like, I, I find that voice is, is also unreasonable. Like I just did this course, right? After I've done so much for it, after I put in all the effort, would you believe after I hit publish, there was this yelling in my head that was still like, unpublish it, what are you doing? Just delete it, forget this whole thing. And it's it's like, why? Now, now you want me to do that after I've done the work? That makes no sense. And just being able to think of it as another person who's putting me down um, makes me better able to say no. Is there, is there ever, um, an example where you, where it's cause it sounds like most of the time it's really good to listen to that, that inner critic or the fear. Is there any time where you felt like it was actually positive to listen to it where, or no, or it's like, like just always kind of set aside the inner critic and like, I would rather listen to external critics. I think. I think it's more useful than than me critiquing myself because even when they agree the external critics have a real a real reason to to say the things that they are. I mean sometimes they're just trolls, right? You just ignore those. But sometimes when they have something that's like negative negative feedback that's delivered well, I, those are the ones that I actually save in Obsidian, actually. But yeah, those are the ones that I listen to. But the one in my head is just like, there's no reason behind it. It's just all negative all the time. So I just filter that out. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I think that acceptance point um, <laughs> is such a good reminder because sometimes I feel like I have a... Uh, a very strict Asian parent in my head, just always <laughs> self critiquing myself. Um, yeah. And uh, pushes me to get better, but it also like that I still haven't put out that Camino vlog because of the perfectionism. So it's the so thanks for sharing that acceptance tip. Well, like with, with Lucky Dippers, um, can you, can you talk us through like how you made that transition from, I saw you stopped posting. I think the last post was like 11 months ago. And I noticed that's around when your current channel started to really take off. I think with some of your first Obsidian with D&D &D videos, Obsidian for Beginners, like those started to get like hundreds of thousands of views. Um, can you just take us through like, so now the, the origin story behind your current channel, uh, the one about tech travel note taking, like why, why did you yeah. start the new one? I was already wanting to change something. Firstly, having a travel vlog is involves you making yourself way more vulnerable than I do now talking about Obsidian. Because as I said, it's like you at your worst, right? And that's what you're showing people. And that's the main, that's the bulk of the content that you're going to be putting out there. And I don't always want to have my life critiqued in that way. Even now, I like when people critique the content of the video, not, you know, 
what I'm wearing or like whether, because in that, in the other channel, sometimes I speak in different languages, sometimes ones that I don't know very well because I'm learning and I'm practicing. And so sometimes people critique that or they, they say something about my relationship or uh, it, it's just a lot to put out there and it's very, very personal. And so when you are the subject matter, it's very hard not to take it personally when someone doesn't like what they see. Whereas if someone doesn't like something about Obsidian, I'm like, okay, there are other tools out there, you know, thanks for watching. And I don't feel like it's an attack against me. So that was one thing that I felt mentally I needed to shift that. And then also there's just time. I really can't do two channels and like grow them and be excited about them. Like mm -hmm. I probably could do them, but I won't like it. <laughs> Got it. So, okay. And, and what, what, um, so what was the, it sounded like with travel, it was some of putting yourself out there on a personal level. It, it was a little bit of a toll, um, being, being judged at personally some at times, but like what prompted you to start a new channel? Um, like, was it like you you started being interested in new topics or you kind of wanted to keep expressing yourself, but just have it be more objective. But like, yeah, what was the, the catalyst? I wanted, I wanted to talk about things at my time, you know, where I can sit in my room and set things up and have the lights up and, and then control when I do that. Cause with traveling, you just kind of always have your camera on or, or in the end, I didn't film all the time. I would say like, you know, twice, twice this week, I'm going to film or something, but even then it's still, you know, whole days when you need to be ready to capture something. And I just wanted something that was more sustainable for me. Got it. So you want to keep expressing, keep it more sustainable. So I know you, when I, when I went back to the, the oldest videos and I, I saw your uh, first video uh, describing like a week in the life as a, as a dev, um, devro, <laughs> and that was really cool. Um, like, how did you think about just finding your topics, your niche, um, you had a lot of experience on your belt, like making a hundred videos is a lot for anyone. Um, so you had a lot of experience, but like, how did you go about thinking like, okay, what am I going to talk about now? I was just trying a lot of things that actually was in my first video. It's the, it's the first video that's out there now, but I unlisted a few that are just not relevant anymore. I was going to talk about load testing because that's my career. And I thought like, if someone is going to want to hear from me, probably it's going to be on the thing that I've been working on and like very dedicated to for the last, you know, over a decade. Turns out that's not true, <laughs> which is a surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is? Is it because is it because there's um all the all the load testers already have a lot of resources or or is it because it's pretty it's a pretty niche topic and it's it's like niche yeah niche or... i think it's a bit too niche and i think people could also see like it was fun when it wasn't my day job and then it became my day job and then i was like okay now i want some other thing to do on the side and i wasn't as excited about doing it 24 7 you know if you're doing it at, at your nine to five and then you're doing it after that too it's like there's only so much enthusiasm you can muster for something that you spend that much time on. And so I tried a bunch of different things. I tried, I still tried traveling. I tried like gear reviews. Um, I tried, uh, and I tried Obsidian and I tried D&D as well, actually. The things that I'm interested in, I just kind of talked about whatever I was interested in because I didn't know what niche. It wasn't intentional at all. I was basically just reacting to what people liked. God, as you tried out a bunch of stuff, reacted to what people liked, like, did you have any type of framework? Or was that pretty much it? it's like, okay, people are vibing with this. <laughs> or was there, were there other variables you thought about to like filter like? No, at, at the time I was just thinking like, I was trying it on to see if I liked it. And then later on, I, I started looking to see what, which ones people were just mo more engaged on. 
And it was funny because my my coworkers knew that I was I was doing a YouTube channel. And the thing that they were asking me the most about wasn't the load testing stuff, which is what I thought my coworkers would be asking about, but they were asking about the obsidian stuff too. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> So what what was the first um what was the first breakout hit? Like every YouTuber has that that hockey stick inflection point with a video. I, I think you have like multiple ones, but like what what was like can you take us through the first one? I don't know that I have one. I, I remember the first one that got the most views for the time. Uh, anything more than like, you know, 10 views. I I remember that because it was from someone who's like I, I call him like a, like a distant mentor. Like he doesn't know that he's my mentor, but I'm just, you know, watching what he does. His name is Sly. <laughs> okay, his YouTube name is Sly Flourish. Um, his real name's Mike Shea. I've spoken to him, but I hadn't at the time. He is a D&D and tabletop role-playing games um, YouTuber and content creator. He writes books. And... He is one of the people that I really admire, not just for the work that they do, but then also for his process, because he he's really he does it in a way that he's always kind to people and he's always providing value for people. And yet he's also making it sustainable for himself. So, um, yeah, so, so he actually found one of my videos. I think I might have mentioned it somewhere. And he found it and he featured it in one of his talk shows. Now, at the time, his audience is all D&D based. I was talking about using Obsidian for D&D. And so when they came to my channel, I didn't really get any extra uh, subscribers or anything for it because I wasn't talking about D and D, which is totally understandable. Mm -hmm. But that was the first time for me where I was like, "Hey, I can." I got to talk to someone that I've been secretly following for so long. You know, like YouTube did that. I did that with a video. Like that's awesome. And I got really excited about what else I could do with it. Wow. I actually, I never knew that story that that's, that's how you got to meet Sly because he posted your video and then, well, can you like, so I guess how did, what was going through, um, and this is a question from, uh, Mich, uh, Pedro, he, he has a cognitive science channel and he was basically asking like, how did you know, um, people were into what you were doing and there was an audience for this and that you could possibly um make like a side side income from it possibly and like what was what was going on internally as you realized um you kind of found that product market fit i didn't know i i didn't really think of it in terms of product market fit I just was trying things and then and then people started commenting on that one and then they started asking questions and I just thought well, I should make a video about that because it's not really the sort of thing I could just say in a comment that I made a video about that and then they loved it even more and it just kind of like became this conversation whereas previously it was more like one way. And I was just like, here's all the things that I'm interested in. And there are a lot of them. And people were going and to my channel and they would probably thought like, what is this channel even about, you know? And so, yeah, so I, I it was just, I was just a, a sheer coincidence, I think, um, that, that I stumbled into something that people really responded to. And then I just responded to that. Got it. Well, and then like, it's, it's kind of crazy. Cause I remember, I think at the time you, when we all met in P2IA, I think we all each had like, like a hundred or 200 ish subscribers. And then like every week you start, like all of a sudden you were at like 800, like all of a sudden you broke through a thousand. And, and then I stopped, like, I was like, Oh, well, I think she's just going to keep going up and up and up. And, um, like what, if if you were a a new YouTuber starting out today, like, and you didn't have you know all of like the hundred videos from Lucky Dippers, like all your um, videos with your Obsidian channel now, like what what would be like the three things that you would focus on and like prioritize, like as a new YouTuber, knowing what you know now, now that you've gone you know in twenty to twenty thousand subs in a year, like. 
I think it was getting stuff set up in my own life so that I could do it consistently. Like that really was always the problem. And also not focusing so much on, on some signals like views, for example, or subscribers. I didn't think that that was very useful for me to focus on. What I did focus on was comments, real comments, not just like, oh, nice video, but like, oh, I, I like the video, but I wish you talked about this. Like, I thought that was more useful. And then also just like remembering that you're supposed to be enjoying this process. And if you're not enjoying it, I think it's going to be pretty obvious. Got it. Okay. So, so building better systems, um, focusing on like the right metrics, or I guess actually audience feedback and comments, um, and actually enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. That, that reminds me of this. Like I was listening to Colin and Samir, um, uh, just, just preparing for this podcast. And they talk about how one of this, like the things that they've noticed after 10 years is it's, uh, longevity is one of like the key variables for, for, doing well, like you compound over time, you get better, you build your audience. Like, and they said the thing that is underlying longevity is, or is just actually being into what you're talking about. So that's, that's, I, it's, it's crazy to me because like, I think we've met so many creators and, and like, when I reflect back on my own experiences, our friends, our, our class, like other classmates and all these YouTube courses we've taken, like you are definitely an inspiration for me because you've, you've been able to find something you're excited about that helps a lot of people. And then that overlap is, is like really amazing. Um, can you, can you take us through, um, your workflow? Just, uh, I know you have the blog post about your workflow and, but for the audience that's at home, I think they'd be really keen to uh, understand how do you do your whole process of, um, ideation, scripting, editing, shooting, et cetera. And how long does each yeah, of those sure. steps take generally? Yeah. The, the ideation part, I think that's hard to quantify because I don't like schedule it and think, okay, now I'm going to come up with ideas. Really, I just love Obsidian. And like, even at the beginning, I could list, you know, a hundred topics without stopping of, of things that I could talk about with Obsidian. Honestly, I was at the point where my husband was just happy that I had found another outlet because he was sick to death of hearing about Obsidian. And so were my coworkers. And so were my friends. I mean, even you, Peter, like I, I'm pretty sure that I've been in, in a call with you all and I'm like, oh, here, let me just share something with you. And you're like, okay, thanks. You know, I just showed it to everyone. And so the, the idea generation part is more like, okay, I've kind of exhausted all of my avenues of talking to me, uh, talking about Obsidian. So like, let me just write it down. And then that just built up over time. And then before you know it, I'm just like exploring my own vault and finding things that I've already written. And it's already like paragraphs of it, sometimes really exceedingly detailed stuff. And then I think, well, clearly I was interested in this at one point enough to do this. Thanks, past me. I'm now going to use it for a video. And then when you start getting comments, like I, I then also move to that. Well, not completely, but like I definitely would um, copy things that that people had said. And then you can you can do a search for it. You can tag it in Obsidian. And I have like a, a nested tag structure where I have one for feedback. And I have like feedback ideas or feedback um, positive feedback, negative. And then I just go through those. And then I look, because in Obsidian, you can see the, the tallies for them. So it tells you how many people have mentioned, have mentioned something that you tagged. And then I just pick the one that, that has the most votes or the most counts. And then I go with that. And honestly, I know a lot of people say they spend the most time scripting, maybe because I do mainly tutorial stuff. I don't spend a lot of time scripting. I do bullet points and not very many bullet points either. And I usually already know how to do the thing that I want to show. It's more like, how do I structure this? You know, how, how should I explain beforehand what I'm about to do and then show it in a way that like flows, that shows a story. 
But that's the advantage of picking something that you already know a lot about. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't I usually don't have to research these things. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Because I when I did my um, fasting for uh, 36 hours video, I had to research how to fast. And then since it's a little it's related to health, I, I needed everything to be evidence based. So it ended up being like, pretty big research project. So it's it's good to hear like that your approach of just all right, teach what you like, share what you know really well. And all you have to do is just make it clear. Well, so scripting doesn't take that long. Um, what about like shooting, editing? Um, like what's that process like for you? Uh, when I film, I, I turn, I usually, it depends on the setup. In Portugal, I only have the one camera. So I, I go back and forth between two countries, Portugal and the Netherlands. So I have a slightly different setup, which I'm trying to work on. I want to make it just all the same. But I like here, I only have the one camera, but in the Netherlands, I have two. And I just literally press record on both of them at the same time. They both have audio and I'm also recording my audio separately. And I just talk and record everything, record every, I don't stop it and then start it again. I just find that it breaks my flow and it makes me feel the pressure. Like, I don't know if I stop it and then I start it. I'm like, oh, this is new. So I got to do this in one take. And I never do. I just, I can't, I can't perform like that. So I just let it run. And then uh, afterwards, sorry, oh, go quick, on. How many takes do you um, generally do for a line or something or a, um, Really, the only thing that I script is the intro, like the first 30 seconds. And oh, and, and the last 30 seconds as well. Like, I think because I, I say like, oh, thank you. Thank you for watching. Check out this video to see more about whatever it is. And that part I think about because I can't just say whatever it is. I have to like go through my videos and think about how to relate it. But um, those ones, maybe I'll I'll have like, five takes or something on I, I have good days and bad days some days I get it into some some days I get it in like 20 some days I I get to 10 and I shut down my computer I'm like I just I I just can't today <laughs> I'm just gonna try tomorrow <laughs> so it it does vary <laughs> Hmm. And do you do you shoot like batch videos do you do you do like two at two in a session or like do you uh yeah, at first I didn't because one video was like way more than enough. And <laughs> then I just got better. Like if I if I make a video that's going to be about 15 minutes, I will probably spend it's still it's still bad now that I think about it. It's still like 40 minutes. But hey, I used to take like an hour and a half for that 15 minutes. Okay, so like so progress. So now I take about 40 minutes for it. And so that means that I can shoot too. But in the beginning, I could never have batch, batch filmed that because then that's just the entire day, I, I'd feel like. And it's also exhausting. <laughs> yeah. I oh, Eunice is asking, mm -hmm. how, come, how come I don't script the majority of my content? Because I think it's more real. I, I like for it to be, you know, at my own pace. One thing is like when I'm giving a tutorial, I don't want to give the impression that like, oh, it's so easy, it's so quick. No, I want you to see where I'm like, oh, which icon? Okay, that, that icon, you know, because that's how you're probably going to be doing it too. So I don't want it to come off as if it's so, so fast and it'll be like unreachable. I, th I thought it was you snap your finger and then a beautiful vault appears with your second brain <laughs> with all the world's knowledge organized neatly, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, okay. So scripting, or, okay. So shooting takes about 40 minutes. It sounds like it's a three X ratio, 15 to 40. That's pretty good. That's, that's actually really got 15 minute video shot in 40 minutes. Wow. And then can you take us through the editing process? Like I, I know you, you personally really enjoy editing. Um, but yeah, how does, how is that process for you usually? So I used to edit everything up until I think the last the last 20 videos or so I edited everything and even even in the last 20 I, I edited a few of them. I have help now. A friend of mine, a very good friend of mine actually offered to help and I very gratefully took his his offer. He also was was in the in the PTYA course 
And so now the workflow is different because, oh, I had to document it. Oh, that's one thing that I would do differently too. When, if I were doing this all over again, I would document how I do things, like where I get thumbnails, where I get, you know, like um, videos that I can use in my videos, like stock videos, stock footage and stuff. Uh, mm. What What is the sequence that I do things? Where do I get icons? What color is, what color of red is my red? I never needed to document the process because it was just me, but it made it really hard to get help. And then we went through really rough times when we were getting started, even though he's like, he's already a friend and he's an awesome editor. It, it was still difficult because I had to show him my way and I didn't, didn't document it. So yeah, I would, I would take my own advice and document that along the way. <laughs> Oh, okay, so that's funny. When you said documentation, I thought you meant like Gary V style, like like, hey guys, I'm doing a podcast right now. But it's it's more like actually tech documentation. <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah. With, with your with your editor, like um, how like oh, well, first of all, where did you put that doc? Is it on which which software? <laughs> It's on Obsidian. So it's funny because he helped me edit the course. And because he went through it, it's like he went through the course himself. So after it, we've been talking about having an Obsidian vault together because he was using Notion and I didn't want to like say, no, we're using Obsidian, you know. So we weren't we weren't sharing that. But what I was doing was I would do it on my Obsidian vault. I'd export it as a PDF and then put the PDF on Dropbox. And then all of that would be available for him. So at least he knows like the bullet points and that has changed too. Like I definitely script more than I used to just because he's like, Oh, what, where are the chapters? Like, where do you want the, he, he does these transitions and stuff. And, and I had to make that clear because I just kind of did whatever I wanted, which wasn't very sustainable. <laughs> Hmm. Well, we're, we're jumping like, so, so for Obsidian, how do you do comments? Like, or, cause I know he has to go into the file and, um, edit it. It gets saved to the Dropbox, then downloads, redownloads to your vault. Uh, but how, how do you comment and collaborate that way? So with, with his comments, actually we don't use Obsidian for that. We use frame.io. So mm -hmm. I give him, I give him all the raw stuff and then I give him like my obsidian script. And then I say, if, I, if it needs an explanation, I'll say, Hey, this file is for, is the A roll. This file is the B roll. And then I put all of that on Dropbox. He downloads it, he edits it. And then his first draft of the video, he would put on, on frame.io. And we put comments there because it's timestamped. So you could say mm -hmm. like exactly at this part, can you put an animation there or something like that? And now we, that used to, I think the first few times we went back and forth quite a bit just because we didn't know, like just communication things. But now I'm kind of thinking like, does he even really need to put it on frame.io still? Cause the last few that he's made, I'm just like, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. So I didn't really have to push back on, on anything. So yeah, I don't use Obsidian for everything. I think frame.io is way, way, way better for timestamp comments. Got it, got it. So maybe Obsidian for everything is uh, course number two, no? <laughs> but um, <laughs> with, uh, with, with your editor, how long did that, that um, editor creator honeymoon process take like to, to kind of get on the same wavelength like because because I know for me I've I've I've, tri I've had trials with like two editors and it's been kind of rough sometimes like how long did that take for you about a month I think and I think that was fast actually because he was already a friend and that has been so helpful. Like he already knew me. He knows, he knows about my values. He knows he was watching my videos because he was in an accountability group with me and was also doing his own YouTube channel. So we were able to talk in a shorthand that I think would be unfair to expect of, of a stranger, of any stranger. Got it, got it. Cause he, okay. So it already kind of accelerated. Well, so when, when you finish it with your edit, do you promote your videos or is it just straight? You're relying on good top, like thumbnails and titles, good videos. I, I promote it in the sense that I usually post about it on Mastodon 
And that's my main social network now. And then it used to be Twitter. I still post on on Twitter as well for for some people, but that's about it. Uh, <laughs> tangent from that is like so. So, what are your quick thoughts on like Elon Musk's handling of Twitter <laughs> as a as a like a someone that's used Twitter a lot and now is on Mastodon? <laughs> yeah, I was always as soon as I heard about Mastodon, which was like a couple of years ago or something, I switched over. Well, I wanted to switch over. I got an account, but it's like a critical mass thing. People need to move on with you. Otherwise, it doesn't matter that it's technologically superior. It, it's not going to be useful. So I was already sold on Mastodon. I was happy when when Elon was saying all the things that he did because it served as an impetus for other people to come join me on Mastodon. I think Mastodon is, you know, it's open source. You control your own data. There's no big corporation that wants to make money off of you. There are no ads. You, it's like this weird thing where you actually only see who you follow unless you want to see the, the most popular ones of the internet, but you can choose what you see. And it's just shown chronologically. I, I find that refreshing. And I, mm. um, with a friend of mine, Marcus, who I knew from work actually, who's now in the Obsidian community as well, he, he and I started a Mastodon instance together. It's just a, a free place for the PKM community to come join us. Oh, oh, you interviewed him too on your, on your, um, on I your did. Channel. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Wow, that's, he that's really Marcus. did research. <laughs> well, you, you because you learn in public, <laughs> I I was able to like have a like a little mini fork of your brain for for this week. <laughs> well, can you, <laughs> yeah. can you take us through like you mentioned in your like top three things that a new YouTuber you would as a new YouTuber today you would prioritize would be your systems like arranging your life so that you can make videos consistently. Can you take us through, um, yeah, how you would build those systems today uh, or what you use now? I would have a list of like a checklist. So in Obsidian, I have a template for everything that I do for every video. It used to be more detailed because I used to have things for videos as well. Like put this camera to this setting, you know, cause sometimes I would change it to take photos. So I needed to write down what settings I was on. Even something like what picture profile are you using? I don't know. So once I accidentally changed it, I'm like, well, I don't know if I if I can find which one it was on to. So the first step to answer also this question by Pooja, who asks what was the first step of building the system? I'd say that template that that is just like a repeatable thing. You, you can just copy and paste for every new video. It's what you start with. And I also have things like um, it, this is from Ali. He has the hook. And then uh, he, the Hive system, and he has the intro, although most of the time I skip that. Then he has the value, which is the main structure of the content. And then he has the end where you kind of point people over to something else that you've made that is similar. And, and I also used to have questions like, you know, what, what, why should a person care about this? Like that, that would be a question in the template. So when I start a video, it's like, it's more like I'm filling out things rather than creating something new from scratch. And then at the end, all of the post-production stuff, like what, what, do you use for thumbnails? Like I actually put, go to Canva and, 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 and copy the template that is this file name. And then, you know, like I put everything in there and then I just go through the list and I'm like, tick, 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 tick. And that's it. It's, it's like, a it's just a way of making sure that you're not going to miss anything. Cause I, I would, and I have really. Yeah. I, I, um, I made a checklist for this this first episode, and the last the last point I had was uh, to pee <laughs> before <laughs> before getting on StreamYard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, now that's funny yeah. that I say it out loud, but uh, but checklists and templates are huge. Like, how long does it take you? How long did it take for you to make that doc? And like, how long is that template? Well, I can I can share it. I think I've shared it with with others too. It it 
it wasn't like I sat down and I wrote it all in one go. It was more like, oh, that thing should be there. All right, let me let me put it in there, you know, and and it just kind of evolved like that. And I think it's going to be different for for different people. Like if you don't edit your own stuff, then maybe you don't have to put so much in the editing part that that I do. And, you know, I kind of just leave that up to my editor when he does it, but I still have my stuff for when I edit my stuff because I forget. Got it. And how, how long did it take for you to put together the, um, the doc for your editor? And how long is that thing? Um, it took, it wasn't just the writing it, but it probably took about two months to get to the point where we weren't changing it so much anymore because he was giving me feedback too. Like he said that sometimes I just make it a flat bullet point list and he wanted to see chapters, like where, where is there a transition? And so I started doing that a bit more. And then he at first wanted to know, like, if there was B-roll that I wanted, I would put it in there as well. So I added to it based on what he what he needed from me, really. Got it, got it. And so now that you've, like, worked through the systems and um, you have the docs, you've been making the videos, like, you know how Ollie talks about, like, the two metrics for succeeding on YouTube, like, getting people to click your video, getting them to like having people want to watch your videos. Like, can you, can you tell us like what, what kind of CTR retention do you usually get? Like, um, what are some ranges that people kind of in an education genre could think are like pretty solid targets to like work towards when they're, when they're trying to optimize those, um, for those variables? Yeah, this might be not the the best way. I'm just going to tell you my way. I don't look at any of that. And I think you know, from what he says, I would replace that with care about your audience and just genuinely enjoy what you're talking about. Because I... I personally... This is not my... This is not my day job. I never wanted to be. This is like my creative outlet. I, I love sharing all the stuff about Obsidian. And so... I my the way that I think of it is different. I don't think of it as a business. I don't actually look at my analytics. I look at I look at comments. That's the main thing that I look at. Um, not how many, but like what what actually are they? And I don't know if that would work for everyone. Certainly, if you're more skewed towards the business, and I I think you probably do need to look at more of those metrics. But I don't. I just do what I like and what people want to see. And hopefully it's, there's something there that's, that has an intersection between the two. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I popped into the, the discord server, um, for your obsidian course and it's like, it's really nice. It, it feels like it's like 400, 500 -ish people that really like obsidian. You're very active in it. It's like, it feels like a very, um, Whereas a lot of discords, I, I get, I feel like I'm just another random person, but your discord feels very, um, like people actually know each other and like, are engaged, like talking to each other as friends. Like, how did you, how did you build up that community and that kind of feel of like people are like actually getting to know each other? By ignoring the voice in my head that was saying like, <laughs> who do you think you are that you even need a discord server? Like, do you think that you're so popular or people want to talk to you? Yeah. Just ignore that and listen to the actual comments from real people who are saying like, Oh, I kind of wish I could chat with you sometimes. And then um, also I was just open about it and all my patrons know like, Hey, I'm new at this. I've never created discord server. Like, let me know if something's wrong. And every now and then they'll be like, Oh, you really should be doing this thing. I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I didn't even know about roles in discord, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I'm just, it's not really something that I'm like, yes, I will cultivate a community, build my brand. I'm just like, oh, these awesome people. I want to talk to them. Maybe, maybe I wish I had a, a space for people to come and, and talk to me. And then I think it's like, I know that money isn't always a good filter because there are some people with money who, who are not genuine, 
but it does filter out a lot of the people who just want your time and want to give nothing in return. So e even putting a, a small amount, like I think on my Patreon, I have like three euro, which is really, I'm not making a living out of that, but it's like a, a barrier to entry that, that just discourages people who are just time suckers. I want people who, who are going to contribute to the community and they have been, that's like my favorite place to hang out. Interesting. So even putting up like a simple, like, I know your Patreon is like, it's like three, $3 and 50 cents. Like, and it's people get templates code, they get access to the discord. So it sounds like it's mainly just a way to kind of know, like filter for people that are, that want to give back. Like, how, when when you're on the community though, like you know, sometimes I feel like I have, I don't know, my channel's not even that big or anything. But sometimes if I get a lot of comments or I'm on all these Discord servers, I I feel like overloaded with about a lot of people pinging me on things. Like, and I imagine for you now with like twenty three ish, twenty three thousand subscribers and your Patreon, your Discord, like how do you how do you respond to all the comments and like skill your time as one person? That's also why I started the Discord, because I would get comments from people on my YouTube videos where they're like, hey, what what is Obsidian? You do code for me. I want an application for free, okay? You know, and, and it's like, okay, <laughs> I can't really give that much time. I'm sorry. You know, and on Discord, people do get a lot of my time because they say like, hey, I need help with this code. I'm really trying this out. And then I go in and I do help them. And I and then the cool thing is I then put that into a vault. So if they if someone needs a data view query or something, they ask me once and I do it for them. But then I also put it in the vault and I say thanks to so and so for the idea. And it's just like, it, it comes back around, you know, it's like, we're all helping each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like. And sometimes I'm not the one that answers it. And lots of times they tell me things and, and tell me about plugins that I should be checking out. And it's much more of a back and forth than YouTube mm -hmm. comments, which is mm -hmm. just like, a lot of people just demand stuff. And, you know, you got to say no to like, just being able to say no is like my number one productivity book tip because <laughs> I just would not get stuff done otherwise. Well, well, with your, with your like discord pings, do you, do you um, respond in real time or do you kind of batch it so that you can get focus work done and stuff? I, I do. I batch focus work. I don't really batch the other stuff because that one I just fit in wherever. But I do, I, I'm a time blocker. I know it doesn't work for anybody, for everybody. Um, I know some people, they prefer to have to-do lists or like the getting things done method. I primarily time block. So if something is important, like if I have a task that's more than two minutes, uh, then I'll actually schedule it in my calendar. And that's because that's, I realized that's how I budget because I'm also very big into personal finance. And that's actually how I budget. I budget every cent that I get. And I know that's, that's way too much for many people. For me, it's so helpful because I have boundaries. Like mm. I know exactly mm. where everything's going and I just mm. have total clarity. And then I just thought a few months, a few years ago now, like, why don't I do that with my time? I do that with my money, but with my time, I'm like, sure, have it. Anybody who, who wants some can have it. Like, wait, I wouldn't do that with money and time is way more important. Well, I was, I was reading your first blog post back in uh, 2018, how you got financial independence. And I, I love how you, towards the end, you talk about how, like what got you out of it was out of being in debt was uh, if creating a budget and for, if you spend in one category, it, it takes away from another category. So you never go over it. Um, sounds like you're doing that with your time with like reclaim and everything. Like um, you, you talk about the priority management and not being more important than time management in your in your video last week and i thought that was super super helpful um and i'm kind of realizing just <laughs> researching this week and learning about you is like i almost feel like your note taking is like a is like a um metaphor for like living a life that and focusing on what matters 
and I, I'm just seeing that theme, like you're just focusing on what matters. Um, and people can call it minimalism and all this stuff, but you're like, okay, I'm taking notes on what matters and I'm going to do use my time for what matters. Like how do you, and it kind of goes back to your core principles. Um, and I know in your video, you talk about how like it's the core principles are how you make tough decisions. Like, can you, can you tell us a little bit about let's like how you came up with those core principles, what your top ones are? Yeah, you already kind of touched on one of them. I don't like the word min minimalism because it's it's still like the word comes from being having less or doing less. And yes, there's this whole thing where less is more, but it it just has a bad connotation for me. I don't want to restrict myself. At the same time, just letting yourself go and just chasing happiness and fun and pleasure is hedonism. So I don't like that either because there's no meaning to that. So I actually prefer a term that is sometimes used in a derogatory way, especially in gaming. It's min-maxing. And a min-maxer is someone who optimizes ruthlessly, even, even at the expense of other things that sometimes people might find more important. But the point is, for a min-maxer, they are laser-focused on that thing that they want. So what does it matter if you give up the other things that somebody else might find useful? Like it's your experience, it's your game. And that's, I like that more because it's more about, it's like minimizing the things that you don't want and maximizing the things that you do get pleasure out of or meaning or satisfaction. And yeah, I guess I, I am a lot like that. And that is one of my my core principles is min-max. And it's actually on Obsidian and everything. But um, two more are definitely honesty. I believe a lot in authenticity and like that, that's why I learn in public. I don't say I'm an expert and you should listen to me because I know what I'm talking about. I find it more realistic to say like, I don't know what I'm doing, but hey, this is what I know right now. And then maybe you can help me if if that's not true, then then write to me and then um, I, I will adjust it and I'll thank you for, for teaching me something. And, and then another thing is open-mindedness. And that comes from like being from different cultures and not really feeling like I belong anywhere mm -hmm. and knowing that other people have had different experiences where they absolutely felt all their lives that they belonged in the country that they were born in. I never had that. And I think that's a privilege that um, isn't talked about as much. So the open mindedness to to like listen to other people's points of view and and learn about other cultures and conceive of a reality that's different from yours. God, and how how would you feel like you've expressed those um, in your YouTube channel? My core principles. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe just one yeah, of them. I, one, one I, of the expression. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I could. I, I do also come back to like, it's interesting for me. It's very important to me. Is it useful for other people? I don't know. They would probably have their own values, right? And just having, not having those as your core principles doesn't mean that you don't value them. I don't know. I guess I would worry about imposing what I think on other people is a that's why it's nice to just talk about how to do things on obsidian not like the methodology you should adopt because it's so personal i can't i can't decide for you mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well can you tell us like like um with all the content creation and and just keeping your core principles in mind like how did you i guess arrive at um obsidian like why did you get into it i know you had the whole like you went from like tiddly wiki to Evernote to Notion to Rome to finally Obsidian. Like, yeah, what, what was it about Obsidian that that made you such an evangelist where you're always talking about it? And even I'm using it. Eunice in the comments says she wants to use it now. Like everyone like that talked to you for like 30 minutes wants to use Obsidian. Like, so why, why, <laughs> what got you so fired up? It's so open. It's so, it doesn't impose 
a structure on you. And I really rebel against that sometimes. Like I find that some tools are very opinionated and there's value to that. If you're one of the people that agree with, with that methodology that they're espousing, I find that with Obsidian, you can really use it in any way that you want, which is part of why it's so overwhelming. But it makes me feel like I can explore how my system is going to be and not go into it like with already preconceived ideas of how it has to be. Got it. So staying open. Yeah. And it, I, I know even in your course, when I was going through it, 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 uh, you talk about one of the best things about Obsidian is just being able to, to do whatever you want, <laughs> um, and learning how to customize. Um, can you take us through like, like how did you, uh, like, why did you come up with a course? Like what, what, what was the, the catalyst for that? people asking me for it and especially especially comments that say like oh i i really like the way you explain things but you're starting so far down the road you're already talking about community plugins and do you have a video where you just talk me through the basics even before we get there and i was not really and that struck me because I felt bad, you know, I, I don't want to exclude exclude people or or make them feel like they have to be using these plugins for Obsidian to function for them. That's totally not what I think. I think when I used Obsidian, it was so bare bones. I needed com community plugins to make it work for me. But now there's so many core plugins that you can really do not just the basics, but more than the basics, just with the core plugins. And so it was comments like that that made me want to do the course because I wanted to show people like this is this is like what you do before. This is like the prequel to the stuff on my channel. And then I would not feel so bad about skipping that step in my excitement. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I, I definitely felt like um, just being your friend, I, I've I've tried Obsidian like twice, but I screwed up my vault files. I like I deleted something on my Google Drive, so then I it got like corrupted, so I couldn't use it. And when I open up Obsidian, I'm not a, I'm more of like I come from like more of the business side of things versus like being a technical um, like coder person. So like learning, even just like hashtag hashtag space gives you a header. I <laughs> it wasn't intuitive for me, <laughs> but um. I, w I will say like you actually going thought the course, about you you did yeah because <laughs> like i needed I thought that of you I in I... sorry oh, go, go i ahead. thought about you in the one where um where showing like when you save something in obsidian where is that like on your computer how do you move things and then uh, there's a file recovery core plugin as well so i was like you know this is something that you definitely want to make sure is enabled here's how you go into it here are the snapshots here's how you roll back to a previous you know like i i was actually thinking of you <laughs> Because I wrote that down. I actually like tagged it in Obsidian, <laughs> like under under feedback and uh, and also with your in your note, just because I think that's a valid experience that I never had. So it's useful to hear that. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, that module actually really helped me because I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to save it on my drive. I'm not going to screw around with the files and I'm going to edit everything from Obsidian, not from <laughs> like my finder and screw things up. <laughs> Well, like, so like going back to your, um, uh, uh, when you apply obsidian to like, you apply it through your templates, like how else do you use obsidian with, with your channel? Is it like, um, throughout the whole process, like whether it's scripting, editing, like, is it mainly the docs? Is it, do you use it for task management, et cetera? I don't use it for task management. I make more because because I really use my calendar for that. But I do use it for planning, like task planning. If I'm not sure what my next steps are, I, I make sure that that plan is in Obsidian. But when I know what my next steps are, all of those get put into my calendar through Reclaim. And then I, yeah, so it's ideation. But the whole ideation thing, it's kind of like a misnomer because it's just one phase. But for me, that's not how it happens. It's like, you know, I'll be sitting on the toilet and I'll get a random thought and I have put it in Obsidian or like I'm reading 
a Kindle in bed and the author says something cool and I highlight that, that goes to Readwise, which then goes to Obsidian. So like, I don't really sit down and think, okay, now ideas, right? So that part, that part happens in Obsidian, but it, it's so nice when I don't start from scratch. So I, I really like that when I go into Obsidian, I'm more like exploring ideas that I already had and seeing which ones I can pull in rather than coming up with completely new ones. Because I feel like if I have to think of new ones, then I don't know, maybe I'm not that interested in Obsidian or maybe I'm not really listening to what other users are thinking about. I feel like I, I've never once thought like, oh no, what am I going to talk about? That's awkward. No, it's like, oh no, which one should I do first? <laughs> wow. So it's pretty natural. Like just from like all the vaults, plugins, <laughs> use cases. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Obsidian is crazy. Like I just even go into your fork, your brain, like you're learning in public vault. I, I was telling you earlier, like it was like, I was felt like I was going through the university of Nicole von der Hooven, like whether it was like load testing, uh, being a creator, all the books you've summarized. It's, it's really crazy. Um, but I got to ask, like when you, when you learn in public, can you tie it to SEO or is it mainly a kind of just a static like vault of information? You can obsidian publish which is what i use it does let it does have a setting for saying whether it's private or not private uh not just private or not private but also like whether it's indexable or not so i've said that it's indexable because that way people can find it so personally i i mean that is part of being public like public isn't just somewhere isolated like on a platform that's isolated but visible like no people have to know how to get there so i do make it indexable yeah and there's also like you could tie a google analytics code to it i i haven't done that oh and can you elaborate on like why you learn in public um i i, I think i i might have a sense but for the audience like what what got you into to just sharing your whole brain. You're really, literally, it felt like I was going through all your nodes of your second brain. It was crazy. But like, yeah, what was the catalyst for that? It's trying me trying to me trying to move on despite the voice in my head, really, because the voice in my head is always like, oh, it's not done. It's not perfect. It's not good enough. And if I frame it, if as just learning in public, not like producing, producing creative work or something like that. If I'm just learning in public, that seems so accessible. Like I can totally do that. I can't pretend to be an expert. I'd be very uncomfortable with that. But if I, if I'm just learning stuff and then showing people what I've learned, I can do that. And I end up creating a lot more stuff in from that way. I also think it's the the fastest way to learn. Like actually when in the current day job that I have for Grafana, I when I joined them for the first week, I was putting out a video every week of me using the application, warts and all. And I found that everyone on the team was very supportive and people were watching it because I was making mistakes. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, that wasn't so obvious. Maybe we should have made that clearer or, or whatever. And they were also learning from how I was trying to do things. And I, that's funny because I've made much more, many more videos since where I'm like, okay, this is exactly how to do it. I know what I'm talking about. And yet those videos don't do as well as like the raw videos of me as a beginner, just trying to figure things out and getting it wrong sometimes. I, I think... I think that that approach is very real. Like I, I, I even find it for me. Sometimes it's a bit off-putting when, for me, when someone tries to impose a methodology or a system, and it's like you don't even know me. You don't know. You don't know what I like. You don't know what will work for me. I think it's endearing when someone's just like, I don't know. Let's. I'm just gonna hit record and watch me learn. I find it compelling because because people learn in different ways and I'm I guess I'm hoping that 
that people will see things that I actually, it's not just a hope. I have put things out there that are very, very wrong. And I get emails that tell me so, and they're mm. right. But that mm. those are all learning experiences. You know, like I'm, I'm also learning in my career, you know, like I'm, I'm learning a lot of observability tools and then people respond to things I've written and they're like, you got that totally wrong. That's not what it does. And the thing is, if you don't have anything out there, they'll never know. They won't just go to you and say like, hey, tell me what you know, because I bet you're wrong. You know, no one's that mean. But if you put something out there, it's easier for people to be like, nope, that one's wrong. No, you should you should change it to this one. So it's like you, you're giving people, you're making it easy for people to teach you. And then it's also a career thing. I, mm -hmm. I've learned that preferring visible work does the best for me in the long term. Yes, it exposes my weaknesses, but that's the reality. You know, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. So you get what you get. Like I, I find that just just really a relief, really. I don't need to I don't need to be in an interview where I have to pretend to be someone that I'm not, because anybody can go and see for themselves what I've spent my career doing, you know, what I've spent my time thinking about. And that's real stuff. That's time not just at work, but also outside of it. So I find it just a, so it's easier to learn that way. It's, it's also content creation. I'm helping people. People mm -hmm. find it easier to help me. It, it's just like, it's good all around. I don't, I wish I'd done it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I went through your, uh, when you shared your Casey Neistat course um, note with us, <laughs> I was like, wow, I, I went through the course. I took like all these crazy notes in notion and they're all jumbled, but I was like, oh, Nicole, like harvested it into like one page for herself and for us. Like it was, it was like a beautiful thing. And then I went to your vault and it's like, you got like, I don't know, 4,000 notes of in the same way that you've harvested. It's, it's crazy. Um, well, quick, some audience questions. Um, so in terms of like your monetization journey, like can you give us a sense of like how long it took for you to make income off of YouTube? And I know you, you're doing this primarily for fun, but um, yeah, can you give us a sense of that? And and um, yeah, like, because I think that that's like something that a lot of creators want to build like financial independence side hustles through their their content. Like, so um, yeah, I guess how long did it take to to finally like monetize? Yeah, so I actually had to look it up. It took me four months and 16 videos, six of which I've unlisted since, to, to get to a thousand subscribers. And I, for me, the monetization, I think it took like um, about two or three weeks after. It was the same month. And, but the thing is, like, people will only ever see that for this channel. They won't know that I've had, I've been on three different channels before that. And they didn't get monetized. Actually, one of them eventually did after mine did. But um, yeah, I think it's it's very, that's why it's hard to compare yourself with somebody else because you don't know what they've done before that. It, this wasn't my first channel. So it still took, it, a lot of people think that, you know, four months, 16 videos is, is not a lot. But well, yeah, it isn't if you're not counting the hundred before it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can you, can you give us a sense, like the audience, like how much, how much do you, can you make from your channel like these days? And is there like a rough breakdown between like ads, sponsors, affiliates, and just, just so like for like a rising creator, they can be like, all right, like if th this is what I could potentially expect if I like keep like making videos, having fun, helping people. So it's funny when I got monetized, I was, I, I'm looking at my notes now. Um, in March, 2022, I, I got my first, it was like a donation. It was three euro 51 cents. <laughs> and I <laughs> actually got monetized on YouTube in that month, but I didn't get it till two months later. And when I, when I did get that, um, my first like real paycheck from Google was 342 euro. So that was really nice, but it was also because of the timing, it was kind of really two months worth because they only pay you out at a certain date every month. Mm -hmm. And then um, at that point, I had 180 from affiliates. So that was 
it, I kind of went from zero to like, what is this, 520? And that was already, that was a big thing for me. But the Google AdSense That's was from, yeah. from two months. And then these days, I don't know, it kind of changes. I recently, I've only had one sponsor. I've only said yes to one sponsor. And I recently knocked them back for uh, another go. Not because they were bad to work with. They were awesome, actually. And I really liked the product and everything. But I just realized that um, I would prefer to make money basically I would prefer to make money on things that I've created, not mm -hmm. affiliate links or mm -hmm. sponsorships. That's like, it's a, it's a personal choice, right? But that's also why I made the course because I want to be the one making the things, not making money off of other people making things. So yeah, so um, I can't share exactly like who, who, paid what because I have mm -hmm. a few affiliates yeah, yeah. but in in total like so from March of <laughs> I, I earned three euros um in December I earned 4,870 euro that and so awesome. um, That's so most of that was was still affiliates and sponsors and I plan to decrease that mm. yeah that brings up a really good point like I, I went to Thomas Frank's office hours and we were talking about like niches and growing our channels and how he built his businesses. And his suggestion to me was like, yeah, it's like a lot of creators. If, if you're, if you're monetizing by showing someone else's stuff, it's the audience, your audience, they're going there for you. And the more you can give them value from you, <laughs> the better it is for everyone versus Thomas. Like why, why would my audience want to learn about a VPN when, they're coming from notion like they, or like they want to learn about what I'm doing with my productivity. It's so that's uh, that's really cool that you're shifting that to, to just sharing more of yourself with the audience. Well, and, um, just quick rapid fire questions. Uh, okay. I'll try. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite, what's your favorite gear for YouTube? Okay, I'm gonna say Sigma, the, the lens that I'm using now, the Sigma um, F114, I think, the 16 millimeter. It's just, I don't know, like how, how my background is all blurry and stuff. It's not as nice here as in my Dutch setup, but like when the lights are behind me, it, it just looks so nice and I don't have to do anything. It's, it's just, it works all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll bang for buck. That's like one of the best lenses ever. Um, favorite book you read in last in the last year? Okay, this isn't a nonfiction book, but fiction's okay, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Project Hail Mary is an awesome science. Like it's a it's sci-fi. I'm I would be surprised if it isn't turn in, turned into a movie. It's written by the same guy who who wrote The Martian. If you've watched that movie, mm -hmm. it blew my mind. Hmm, okay. And then favorite course you took last year. I know you've taken so many courses. I'm going to say slow growth by Matt Diavella because I've taken a lot of YouTube courses and his was a good balance of information and authenticity. And the whole premise is that you shouldn't break your neck trying to grow as fast as possible. Instead, you should have intentional slow growth. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to make it sustainable, which has been very true for me. Mm -mm -mm. And if your house was burning down, and I know you split your time between Portugal and the Netherlands, but let's say one, the one you were at was burning down, what three things would you grab first? Does my husband count? <laughs> uh, well, no, no, no people. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, whatever you want to grab. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, definitely my husband first because he he might be oblivious to the fact that the house is burning down. My passport. So we have a passport like holder for both of our passports, and um and I would grab that and then my laptop. <laughs> and you got your Obsidian Vault synced in the cloud, so it's all good. And you got. I wouldn't even think of that. Yeah, it's all backed up all the time, like quadruple backed up. <laughs> I feel like I could do a podcast asking you all about your backups because that's like so key and underrated. Okay. Um, if you could jump into a time machine and go to any place or time for 30 minutes, who would you talk to? I would talk to my dad before, before he died. Got it. Oh, yeah, that, got it. Got it. And if you created a map of content 
of your whole life and you had an index, um, everything in your life is on that left sidebar of obsidian as the, the raw data. What, how would you, um, create that map of content? Like what dimensions would you use to organize everything? I wouldn't organize it. I would just keep creating new notes and see what clusters form and then try to think about what I can do in those areas. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. That is such a powerful <laughs> comment. Wow. Okay. And what is the most important vault in your life? The one that I'm publishing, the one that I share regularly. Nice. Okay. And um, just to wrap up, if if a new creator was listening to this interview today, what's the one thing you hope they take away? That we might be spending a lot of time trying to be an influencer, but what, what isn't often talked about is that the people who are influencers are often the ones that are the most influenced. And you're going to need to find a way to, to prepare yourself against that. Ooh, wow. I think about <laughs> that one. That one's not rapid fire. Okay, I got to think about that. And which, which <laughs> comment? <laughs> well, I was like, whoa, it's a two-way thing right there. Bi bi bilateral feedback. Okay, which comment or video are you most proud of from your channel? The ones that say mostly from women who are like, oh, I, I thought I was too stupid to understand Obsidian because I'm not a developer and I thought you had to be a developer and I just couldn't get it. And I've watched so many videos and they went so quickly. Thank you for explaining it on my terms. Those are those are the best. Mm, well, I'm I'm not I'm not a female, but I uh, I definitely am in that camp of I was overwhelmed <laughs> and uh kind of annoyed at Obsidian at first, and then you made it um, something I'll probably use every day, which is crazy. Um, wow. Yeah, like the Daily Note, the Pomodoro, the, the Habit Tracker. Well, if um, if people, so, so just to kind of um, wrap things up, uh, if people want to, I know you have your course, you just launched it yesterday, and uh, Obsidian for everyone, I will put the link in the show notes. And if, if people want to go to your Patreon, how do they stay connected? Yeah, sure. Um, I have keyboard shortcuts for them. So this is my course if you want to check it out. And I do do a lot of things on my Patreon. They always get everything first. And I put that in the chat as well. Nice. And then are there, are there any other ways people should um, just learn about your work online uh, that we can direct them to? Yeah, sure. I, I think probably Mastodon is the best way right now because I'm I'm really loving it. Um, so you can join. It's for free. It's not just mine. It's like a community thing. PKM.social. And I'm at Nicole because I can. <laughs> and uh, I guess you can go to, to my site as well it, and also my YouTube channel. I'm typing I'm typing this out on in chat as well. <laughs> Awesome. So you yeah. don't have and to if, look for it later in post. Yeah. And I'll also drop those in the description in the show notes um, as well. Yeah. If, if anyone's listening, I would highly recommend um, especially checking out the fork your brain link because that will show you how <laughs> amazing Nicole, your brain is, but also what you, what you as a listener, you could um, how you could harvest your learnings and share it. It's like, it's pretty crazy. Um, well, thank you so much, Nicole, for taking the time. Um, this was uh, a real treat to be able to, to kind of fork your brain in public uh, through this podcast. And um, thank you everyone that tuned in and asked questions and keep creating. And hopefully we will see you soon. Thank you for having Thanks. me, Peter. It's always nice to talk to you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole.